interesting note, by the way. I should tell you that uh, next week we will be taking the week off. So we're going to take the week off next week from our usual broadcasting schedule. Uh, but usually we come to you every Wednesday. We've been doing this now for over three and a half years. We have 175 episodes in the tank. Lots of podcasts to listen to about any kind, any number of kinds of discussion points uh, that we've been doing here for the last three and a half years. Lots and lots of guests from around Indianapolis. We're always interested in getting Christians who are doing good based on Titus 3, 1, 8, and 14. Do good, do good, do good. And that's our focal point, uh, not just today, but every day when we broadcast. Uh, we want to also emphasize uh, the Cominius Institute, which is the poster right behind us, for those of you on Facebook Live uh, chatting with us already. Uh, Cominius Institute, we cross three bridges. The first is into college, where at IUPUI, our focal point is always going to be helping young Christian college students think Christianly about their subjects and about their disciplines, answering questions that they have about things that they hear in and around campus discussions. The second bridge we cross is into communities. We, we are doing that right now through our radio show. And our focal point is always to bridge cultures. So we're engaged with lots of Christians from lots of denominations and churches, uh, various uh, political beliefs, cultural beliefs, uh, national, linguistic backgrounds, whatever the case, uh, uh, in and around Indianapolis. The third bridge we cross is into culture. We are constantly doing this by writing, speaking, and teaching. So, for instance, if you're ever interested, our Truth in Two uh, process, our two-minute videos where I explain a Christian truth in two minutes to people, uh, that is coming out every Tuesday. You can go back and log in to an awful lot of stuff that's there on our websites. Go to CominiusInstitute.org.com or go to my personal website, at Warp and Woof, that's W A R P A N D W O O F dot org, and you'll find thousands of uh, podcasts, video teachings, all different kinds of things there that you can access for free. But this morning, we are really grateful to have a special guest here, and we are going to be interviewing Liesl Mertz, and we are grateful for uh, your processing to come to us today. Thanks ever so much for your time and attention. I'm glad to be here this morning. So let's uh, start where we always do with all of our guests. Tell us a little bit about yourself, wherever you'd like to take that. Okay. I am a native of Indianapolis. I live here with my husband, Luke. I am the parent of five children, four of which are still living. Um, my eldest is Ada. She is just getting ready to start middle school next year, so it's a whole different life stage. Then there's Magnus, who's nine. Um, he loves playing soccer and Civil War history. Jemima is my kindergartner. Um, mm -hmm. She just learned how to ride a little motorbike this week. Like, she is a motorcycle rider, which is <laughs> so awesome. I was never that cool as a six-year-old. <laughs> and then Moses, who turns five um, next month. And what else? I, um, I love paddle boarding here in town. We can be found on the trails of Eagle Creek or on the waters of the White River, oftentimes in a little flotilla as a family. Um, and we have a dog who is unfortunately prone to running away. We're trying to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. What's the dog's name? The dog's name is Tozer. He was a rescue dog. Um, and he's great, but he, he gets out. Um, what else? I love, I'm an avid reader of the news, a weekly subscriber to The Economist and The New Yorker that I love. Um, and I'm part of this exciting new venture that I'm all about cultivating empathy in the workplace. So that is taking up a lot of my time and bandwidth, and it's a work that I believe deeply in. Nice. Well, i got to tell you that in your biography, there is so much to unpack here. Uh, so let's take out pieces. Uh, first of all, I should uh, say this to our guests, that quite frankly, it seems to me that we should have a whole episode just based on the names of the children and the dog in your family. So we can talk, start there. They're, they're great names. Um, Ada, my husband wanted a biblical name, um, and unfortunately the number of women named in Scripture is unfortunately low, but Ada is a minor character in Genesis. Um, she's the second woman named in the Bible after Eve. Um, her middle name is June, after her great-grandmother. Mm. Magnus is a family name. Um, that is my grandfather's name. Um, and his middle name is Emmanuel. Magnus means the great one. Yeah. And we liked pairing that with Christ as with us. 
Um, a daughter that I will talk about, my daughter who died, is Mercy Joan. Joan is my mother-in-law's name. Mercy was chosen um, because we were really praying for God's mercy in a complicated surgery. Mm-hmm. Jemima um, is my fourth child. She's Jemima Rahab. Um, and I found that, you know, in the aftermath of having a child die, mm-hmm. there was the pregnancy after that child, and naming her felt really important and impactful. It was mm-hmm. like all of this complication of grief was somehow um, being funneled. I. I was in an MBA program, and I still have an image of myself like six months pregnant on this exercise bike in the bottom of the YMCA with this name book that I just poured over for um, for weeks, it felt like, because I thought, I, I want to be able to pray for this child. <coughs> what do you name the child after loss? Um, and Jemima actually is from the final chapter of the book of Job, um, the character of Job in Scripture has lost so much. He's been so reduced. Um, And in his restoration, his children are named, um, and he has three daughters that are named as some of the most beautiful in the land. Um, And another thing that I really liked is these daughters actually, and this was particular especially in ancient times, they're given an equal share of the inheritance with all of their brothers. Um, So I like the economic equity and um, part of that. But one of the daughters is Jemima. Hmm. And then our... And Rahab, um, we like from the story of um, just her tremendous courage of coming out from her people to join, um, yeah, the, to join the people of God um, more fully. And our last child, you didn't know how long my answer would be when you asked. Please, about I mean, keep going. That's great. Um, my youngest is Moses. Moses has uh, a heart condition that we were able to see at his twenty-week scan. Um, it's called Tetralogy of Fallot with Pulmonary Atresia. Um, which basically you have four valves in your heart. You need all of them. Um, and Moses was missing one completely. So he would be the baby that 100 years ago would have been born, turned blue, um, and just died, and you wouldn't have known why. All that to say, we knew from early on that he was going to need early and urgent medical intervention. Um, and Moses, the sense of like this kind of hovering menace and the child that God's hand was on and preserved um, was something that felt really resonant as a name. And it it paired well with Murtis. And his middle name is Einer, which is another family name. So those are the names of our children. And and the dog just came to us. The dog was actually named by a previous owner after A.W. Tozer. And it's a really cool name, but I can't take credit for it. That's a shout out to um, Megan Flynn, who named that dog. Uh, So... Yeah, the Tozer issue. I was going to ask you if if his nickname was A W. So we'll, yeah. we'll just leave it's that close. one alone. Yeah, his his nickname is usually um, less savory these days as he's been running away. It's, it's probably muttered <laughs> under one's breath. Oh, that's hilarious! Yeah. That's hilarious. Um, you know, honestly, I, like I said, we could have a whole show just on names. I mean, I, I love etymology. I love the history mm-hmm. of names. I think they're powerfully important in Hebraic tradition for anybody who's read you know, stuff like this that I've written on or spoken on in the past. Mm-hmm. Naming in the Hebrew tradition is important, imperative uh, for the future, uh, not only for the family, but also of the race itself. Mm-hmm. So I'm always taken by the fact that, you know, when somebody actually has taken the time, which you mm-hmm. obviously have, to deal with uh, names, uh, and it matters so much to you so deeply. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of woven through your spirit. You can tell as you're explaining all of this to mm-hmm. us, you know, uh, all of that matters. Let's go back since you have um, commented a couple of times on your child who has died. Um, Let's have you explain to us your viewpoint Mm -hmm. of uh, this event, Mm -hmm. if I could say it that way, Mm -hmm. in your life. And then perhaps in some way, if you would segue that with Mm -hmm. us into your empathy focus. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking about Mercy Joan. Um, I would say... A sadness for any parent who has had a child die is how few people, like, I'm Ada's mom at school. I'm Magnus's mom on the soccer field. There are so many people who know me in that context. Um, But I would wish for my whole life that more people would know me as Mercy's mom because Mm. it is such a deep part of who I am. So um, I was offered a scholarship to attend um, the Kelly School of Business Mm in an MBA program, and that was fantastic. We, uh, my husband and I had worked um, 
out of college. We'd lived overseas. I was doing international development work in Kenya. During that time, I thought, I'm going to get a master's degree, um, maybe in international development. That was really an area I was passionate about. But in that world of um, international aid, I realized, like, oh my gosh, I'm having to write these grants, and I have no idea what I'm doing. It would really be helpful to know how money works. I, I feel like that would be important. Um, so I was applying to graduate programs in international development, but also in business. Um, Cali School gave me a great offer. I said yes. And a week after saying yes, I found out that I was unexpectedly pregnant with our third a little girl named Mercy. But I thought, that's, that's fine. We've done this, this kid thing. We'll be flexible. We'll be resilient. We'll figure it out. So we moved to Bloomington. Um, and it was at my 20-week scan that, um, and, and I'd had two uneventful pregnancies before. And um, the doctor was away. I, interestingly enough, I was reading at that time a, a Beekner book in the, in the waiting room. Mm. Um, and he was talking about um, interacting with people with disabilities. And I was reading that section. Um, and it's just interesting as a footnote. But when the doctor came back in and said, um, you know, we've seen something on the scan that is worrisome to me. And it was a condition um, that's pretty rare. She'd never seen it. It was called an encephalocele, which um, the base of Mercy's skull had not closed. Mm. It's, it's a range of neural tube defect that if it's lower, it's spina bifida. If it's higher, it's anencephaly, which is always terminal. Um, but there was this wide area of um, outcomes that can happen with an encephalocele. And they weren't sure whether this would be something that would be operable or whether it would be terminal. If Mercy would be um, a little girl who would need a lot of medical care and surgeries and developmental delays. Mm -hmm. um, so for the remaining 20 weeks of my pregnancy, we were meeting with neurosurgeons. We were meeting with hospice care. We were trying to hold openly this hope for a range of different outcomes. And this is in the midst of like, I'm going to accounting class and finance class and oh, team word. meetings. Um, and you're already an outlier being pregnant in an MBA program. Sure. Um, and some people knew and some people didn't know. Um, it wasn't something that I was hiding, but, you know, to a number of people, I was just the very pregnant, you know, woman in their marketing class. Right. Um, Mercy was born in February of 2012. Um right before spring break started in my MBA program. And it became really clear as soon as she was delivered that any intervention would be doing things to her and not for her. She had a lack of connectivity between the hemispheres of her brain. Her spinal column mm. was hollow. Um, mm. and it was hor like, it's horrible news. It mm. remains a defining tragedy of my life. Um, there's never a right time to lose a child. Everybody's story is particularly sad in its own way. Um, we had eight days that she lived that we um, got to be with her. We had friends and family come in from all around the country, um, spent overnight time with her in the hospital. She was held constantly. Um, you know, my sister played her ukulele for Mercy. My brother showed her clips of Last of the Mohicans because he was like, no one... No one should go without seeing some of these films. Um, she was able to come home to home hospice care. Um, mm. Mm. They weren't sure how long she would live mm. off of the ventilator. They said um, it could be anywhere from five minutes. You know, they, they had practice, and they said, we don't think she'll stay long. I felt really led at the time to pray, like, God, would you give us a, a morning and evening, a morning and afternoon and an evening with mercy? Um and we actually got that in a twofold way. She lived for two days um, mm -hmm. off of the ventilator um, before she died. And there are so many things um, that I could say. I mean, it throws you onto, like, the things that you've said for a long time about, like, what is my place in the world? Who is God? How does his provision work? The things that come mm -hmm. out so easily before you're actually in tragedy. Um, and it was a very... Um, it was a time that felt like it had a lot of splinters to it you know it mm. wasn't like and, and for me I was like I'm not going to say it if I don't feel like it's true like I, I, I'm not going to fall back on some easy cliche and so it was really wrestling with gut like God who are you to me in this I'm forever grateful that I had um, a community of people that gave me the space to be like it's okay it's okay that you're angry 
It's okay that you're exhausted. Like, just keep, that the act of faithfulness is actually not to have to sugarcoat that, but to keep, like, honestly saying, okay, like, God, here I am in this. You know, what would you, how, how would you encounter me in this? I want to just keep coming before you in all the complexity of my emotion. Um, how it relates also to the work I'm doing is it gave me the interaction with, um, because you need support. Like, there's so much. I'm, I'm still trying to go through an MBA program. Like, I'm coming back to classes the next, you know, quarter. Um, I still have two living children to parent. I'm trying to stay married. You know, the, the um, percentages for divorce of people who have had a child die are staggering. They're, any, they're quoted anywhere from, like, 60 to 75%. Um, and you need people to, like, step in. And some people did that so intuitively and so well. Um, I, I can think of, I often mention this person as I think about empathy in the workplace. There was Gail from Student Services at IU, and she showed up um, in the hospital room, and she had this handwritten note from the dean and a gift, and she was my contact person with all my professors, so I didn't have to tell them. Um, and that, that did not make it better at all, but it made it better to come back and feel like, okay, I can actually come back to class. Um, I had a great community of family and friends, of people cleaning my house, of people um, watching my kids. There was one of my mentors at the Kelly School let us use their house in Arizona for a week just to, like, get away. Um, so there was tremendous kindness. I also experienced the people who totally missed me, and they probably had no idea how much they missed me um, in their comments or just the people who didn't say anything. And then it becomes really weird and awkward of being like, you know my child has died and you've never said anything. And um, that has informed the work that I am now a part of as a workplace empathy consultant. Because as I have um, gone it for the last nine months or so talking with different managers and HR directors um, and also focus groups of people who have just lived through really hard stuff, I would say that um, there, organizationally, there can be an initial touch point with like the HR department in a company, but most of the life within an organization is lived under a given manager and with a given team. Mm -hmm. And what I keep hearing from these people is they feel totally overwhelmed and under-equipped in how to step into this stuff in meaningful ways. So they're either defaulting to silence, you know, I don't want to say anything stupid, yep. I'm not going to say anything at all, or um, or they're tossing out these tired cliches that somebody told mm. them yeah. 10 years ago. Um, and it really does make a difference. If we're wanting, even if you're just looking at the bottom line of you know producing the widgets and staying on schedule, to help employees survive and stabilize and thrive. Um, the Grief Recovery Institute did a study in the early 2000s trying to put numbers to what is actually the dollar loss to American businesses um, from grief-related loss. And that's not just having someone die. That's um, a relationship transition, even a pet dying. And to say that if you take that in its aggregate and factor it into how people are, um, how they're checked out of work when they're sad and overwhelmed, the time that they spend just looking on WebMD instead of you know, doing client prospecting, all the way to the people who feel so mishandled and I've talked to a lot of people that they, they quit and they say, I can't work here anymore. Then you're retraining and you're rehiring. Um, that cost is, at the time, they said $75 billion of loss. If you adjust that for 2019 numbers, um, that's closer to $100 billion. Um, all that to say, that's a long answer, but we want to give people a tool to do empathy better and to be able to measure it and reap the results. Well, let me speak for everybody who's listening uh, to this broadcast and later on in the podcast uh, that we uh, are tremendously sorry for your loss Thank you. and that the loss, uh, I can only imagine, mm -hmm. continues mm -hmm. uh, and that the loss is now a, a permeation point for you mm -hmm. in this new endeavor as you've just begun the process. Um, this is a tremendously vital uh, engagement that you're uh, providing us with here this morning and we're grateful for your transparency and your honesty and your openness to it all. 
um, excuse me, Mark, but Joe Whitchurch is on here, and he says he has a niece uh, who has a daughter with a similar heart condition, mm -hmm. and uh, Bethany Knight is her name, and the guest reminds him in appearance of a thoughtful Christian friend named Candace Verville. Are you familiar with Candace? I'm um, not, but she, I, uh, hi, Candace. Yeah, he came in late and uh, said that um, uh, graduate and faculty uh, ministries with IBCF, and there was a Christian fellowship in the Kelly School of Business at IU Bloomington, mm -hmm. and a couple of strong Christian people that you might want to meet up. So uh, that's fantastic. Great, great show, and they're loving this content. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's great stuff, mm -hmm. HB. Thanks so much. Um, I'm always grateful for the intersection of people. You know, HB even you know just stepping in and saying, "Hey, this is what's going on." Since I can't see the monitor. Um, your connection now because of your own loss to help people with other losses uh, it strikes me to say it this way uh, make a comment if you'd like Christianity is an others centered religion mm -hmm. as as much as we recognize that 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 is the truth of things we also recognize that God has made us in the way that he's made us and given us the things to go through that he's given us the things to go through as difficult as they may be in whatever given setting that may be. And then, of course, it reminds us of 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 7, mm -hmm. that we are to comfort others with the same comfort mm -hmm. that God is, of comfort has comforted us. Um, it seems as if that this is maybe the propellant in some ways for you to engage in this particular endeavor. We're going to be coming back in just a few minutes. We're going to be taking a one-song break. Uh, we're going to continue this great discussion with, with Liesl about her work and empathy consultation. You're listening to Warp and Woof Radio, radionext.tv at the Cool Groove site. If there are others of you who would like to comment, uh, contribute in whatever way, please feel free to do so. Uh, you can do that on Facebook Live, of course. You can shoot us a message. Uh, feel free to text me, in fact, at 630 303 4891. Warp and Woof Radio, we'll be right back. And we are back. Warp and Woof Radio at RadioNX.TV at the Cool Groove site. We come to you every Wednesday from 11 to 11.50. And today we are speaking with Liesl and uh, specifically about the issues of empathy. And just came off uh, a very uh, touching and important concept about the loss of her daughter uh, some year, some seven years ago. And she wanted to pick up where she left off with that. So, uh, Lisa, let's just go right back to that. You were talking about um, a motivating force as it relates to faith. Um, and I liked a number of things that you said. One thing that also has felt deeply resonant and important to me is to be able to say, out of my worldview as a Christian, um, which not everyone that I encounter shares, but I actually, um, I believe that God hates death. Like, he hates the brokenness and the hard things that happen. And, and sometimes I think there's a sideways way in the manner in which we speak about um, God's plan or his control that we, like, actually mute the deep reality of, like, death is God's enemy. Like, he was willing to go to so many lengths. And, like, he doesn't delight in my daughter dying. He doesn't delight in my son's heart defect. Like, he wants relationships to be thriving and bodies and that's where when I talk about you know what is so deeply important to me is this idea of like all things are being <coughs> new like everything that is broken we have a new earth like a new heavens and a new earth that is coming that's that hope and that allows me to actually resonate really deeply with someone who is saying this is so hard I hate this it's so complicated just to be able to like sit with them in that and to say yeah and and god hates this too like hmm. i don't there are further conversations that one can have and follow up and more things we can say but actually that ability to just sit in that moment and be like yeah like this is really hard one, um, of, one of the things that's important to suggest alongside your mm -hmm. excellent thoughts here is uh, when jesus was performing miracles mm -hmm. And he was making a man's hand whole, for instance, mm -hmm. or right, raising someone from the dead. Um, of course, these people all died at mm -hmm. some juncture. Mm -hmm. These miracles, these life miracles were statements from God through Jesus, obviously God's son, that he's, this is something that is yet to come. These are markers of something that we can anticipate and look forward to. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to look ahead but Jesus basically doing this stuff saying, 
see, this is the way things are going to be. Yeah, and, and I believe that the best of Christian thought and community calls us to be thinking in an outward way, mm. to be actually seeing not just the people like in our community or like in our community of faith or the people that we like seeing, but like what does it mean to have eyes to see like like the health and the beauty and the but also the hurt of like this person actually is my neighbor like we're called to have this radical concept of i am i am a neighbor even to my enemy you know and um hmm. and that is the that is the work of empathy if you if you take that global concept and you bring it down into let's talk about um the workplace or your family context hmm. to actually like see this person is hurting like oh maybe i've heard i've heard that um tom on my team is going through a divorce and i is in a human level can say like that's got to have a lot of complication for tom yeah. um i want to at least acknowledge you know and not having to be quick to offer like an answer or advice or even one's own story so in in consultations and trainings that i do that's something that people go really quickly to like Tom Tom says I'm I'm getting a divorce. And and what that prompts in you is oh my spouse is horrible too. I've been thinking about getting a divorce for years. I totally understand where you're co-, you know and people are trying to identify but what they're really doing is radically taking the attention off of Tom and now Tom's in the position of having to comfort and respond to them. And it's it's these sorts of things that actually so empathy number 1 it's important. Number 2 it can be taught, um, hmm. which is part of what I'm doing as I'm doing workshops and trainings, but also what what we want to do at Handle with Care and what we'll be raising capital to do is to build out a software-based tool that deploys these micro-learning modules in real time to be able to train someone to say, okay, when someone comes back after the death of a parent for the manager, here are two good things to say. Here are three things that you never should say. Okay, um, when you're distributing workflow across a team, how are our ways to frame um, the people for the people picking up the slack um, in a way that like gets people on board and kind of um, does an end run around the resentment that could develop? You know, here are two framing statements at the beginning, two at the end, having those be in really digestible um, bits that people can put into practice right away. Um, one one image that has been resonant about that for me is because people, you know, I, I talk with HR directors and they say, oh yeah, we've got a need for this and we could really see the impact that it would make. But then when you start, when they start, I can see their wheels spinning when they start thinking about like, can you really give me a tool that is going to make this manager who's not super empathetic, like um, be able to be functionally helpful in the case of a miscarriage all the way to, um, you know, my dog died. Like, that's a broad skill set. Um, and I'm hopeful, and I believe that we can, because we've actually figured this out in the world of the physical. We have these people called first responders, and it's like a basic skill set that we train people in mm. to equip them with tools to be able to stabilize someone. Um, they're, not, they're not a doctor. They haven't gone to medical school. In the same way in the social-emotional realm, like we're not making counselors. There are people with degrees to do that. They're not an ambulance driver. Um, what they are is someone who has the skills to assess whether it's somebody getting hit by a baseball bat or hit by a car, how to stabilize them to that next care that they might need. Mm. Um, and that's what we want to do in workplaces. That's what we want to do in equipping. We want to be able to train people with a basic skill set that allows them to assess and help stabilize that individual to whatever next care they need because we spend more time at work, like awake, than we do at home. And oh. we're in this position of emotional, social first responders. Mm. Wow. Uh, you know, quite frankly, it, it sure sounds like this should be in practice across the board, throughout the country, throughout the world. Uh, people need to have this kind of teaching. You said, Thank you. You can be one of my sales advocates. Oh, <laughs> as we, as well, we I'm our, in, in my mind, I have to be honest and say, in my mind, I'm already uh, trying to decide, okay, when can we get you to uh, contribute an essay to Warp and Woof mm -hmm. so that we can push this out and get more people invested in it? 
Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm already thinking about we have to have a whole show just on names, you know, for instance. So, <laughs> I, anyway. I put a lot of time into those names. Uh, you noticed that. And, 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 my, and my husband, Luke Murtis, as well. Yes. It was not just me. Shout out to Luke. Thank you so much. And actually, Jemima was my mother's idea. So oh, she, cool. she planted that first seed. And we, we had a long back and forth about the syrup thing. But yeah. we like the name Jemima a lot. You know, honestly, that's just a tremendous, uh, not just a throwback, but should be a throw forward to uh, an awful lot of what we yeah. ought to be thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to this issue of empathy and what happens in the workplace, um, you are just getting this going, right? I heard you say that you're raising capital. By the way, um, I really stink at that. So anything that you can help me with in that regard <laughs> for a nonprofit. Yeah. But nonetheless, um, the point, of course, of all of this is to get people help. Mm-hmm. And the focal point, of course, from your Christian worldview perspective, as you well put, put it, is an other-centered point of view, giving people the tools uh, to engage this. So one of the things that uh, I noticed here this morning as I was reviewing uh, after our conversation on the phone and going back to your website I thought maybe it would be helpful for you to, to tell people what is the name of your website mm-hmm. and uh, then also to kind of break down some of the things that they might find there that would help them direct them toward these tools you're talking about. Yes. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, we are in the midst of a rebranding process. So right now all the materials are hosted on my personal website, okay. which is w, well, it's lieselmurdis.com, and I can spell that. That's L-I-E-S-E-L, and then M-E-R-T as in truck, E-S dot com. Some of the resources that are there are um, blog posts that I have written. Um, They include aspects of my personal journey um, with the care of Moses and mercy, and then things about like the power of attentive listening. Mm. Um, Another really exciting thing that we have launched in the last week and a half is the Handle with Care Empathy at Work podcast. Um, That can be found in all your favorite podcast places, be that Spotify, um, Google Play, iTunes. And um, in that podcast, we're really looking at um, being able to equip people towards empathy through the power of story. So each week, we have a guest to share about this category of events that we call disruptive life events. That's purposefully broader than just grief. Could a company returning to work postpartum or relocating or a relationship transition? So someone comes and talks about that situation. Um, This week, we have Beth and Andy Long talking about their journey of adopting a child um, from the DRC, as well as the complicated needs of their youngest that dovetailed all at the same time Mm -hmm. with the hardest six months of their lives. And in the midst of that, um, something that we bring out every episode is how did people support you well, and what were ways that you were really missed in that? And we end each episode with three actionable points for someone um, to make them a better coworker, a better manager, or a better friend. So that's something that um, is lovely for personal listening. I also hope it can be used in workplace environments, in teams, just to foster conversations. While one story is not normative to every story, um, I, I think that there are global things that can come out. Um, there's also information about workshops and um, lunch and learns. I'm, I'm doing various speaking engagements around Indianapolis. I'll be speaking at the Christian Rainmakers event next Tuesday morning um, and some HR conferences coming up, the Indiana Wellness Conference in September. Um, but that's all building awareness. Um, the vision is really to have um, a much wider tool that can be deployed beyond me being in person um, and used in all. I, it's a tool for employers that want to be employers of choice. They're already thinking about employee well-being in a labor market where people are fighting on employee attraction and retention and they're having kombucha on tap and ping pong tables to say this is actually like a really important aspect of caring well for your employees um, and building into that metrics to be able to track Mm. how it's being utilized, how it's being done, um, because we don't want this to just be an emotional purchase. We want it really to be uh, ingrained in the fabric of the life of an organization. Um, So yes, we are embarking on raising capital. We have some beta modules that we're testing out to get some good feedback on, and Mm. it's really exciting. Um, I think they're is both a 
human need and a market opportunity that this hmm. meets in some exciting ways. Anybody who uses the uh, the term beta has got to have been reading The Economist in New Yorker, <laughs> so it's pretty obvious those are uh, those are the kind of connections there. I just throw it out to sound. Yeah, good. exactly. That's great stuff. Ask me what I've learned about Google and LinkedIn ads. I can get way into the minutiae. Wow, that. We're but go it, to, it would not be exciting. Yeah, well, we'll stay out of those weeds for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I did want to uh, suggest uh, something that. Uh, might be really helpful, especially because you have so many children and, mm -hmm. you know, you're a mom and active and involved in their lives and so on. And I, I wonder, too, if you've uh, thought about actually doing some video teaching on this. Mm. I have not, but I'll throw that into the hopper. Please throw it into the it hopper. I really, yes. I really do think that that would be something that would be really valuable for people. And, uh, you know, with so many different folks coming out with so many different tools these days, Anytime we link the visual and the verbal together, I think it's well, very powerful. Well, I would say that that is one part of these micro-learning modules that, okay. we're willing, that we are building into the software-based tool. Mm. Um, because to equip managers um, to be able to do this well, it can't take over their day. That's, that's the limitation of some of the resources that are currently out there. Mm. There are some excellent books that have been written on the topic. Not, not enough, but I've gathered some great practitioners. But even the most forward-thinking manager you know, if something happens, they're they're really not going to read even an 80-page book on the topic. And it needs to be something that is targeted, yes. digestible. That's where the video comes in. If somebody's got two minutes to watch a cat on a Roomba, yep. they can watch um, how to help their coworker come back. If you can, you know, and you mentioned this uh, during our break, and you say shout out a word to this, uh, this book um, that's important to you, but... Just taking a book, let's say, for instance, and breaking it down in two minutes and giving the salient points for folks, yeah. I mean, I would see this as tr tremendously helpful to people. Right. Um, yes, can, can I name a please. couple of books? Yeah, please okay. go right ahead. Um, a couple of great books on the topic. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg wrote Option B after the death of her husband. Who um, It's about resiliency in general, but she also really walks through her own narrative journey of having to come back to the workplace. She's the CEO of Facebook after her husband died, um, tragically and unexpectedly. There's a book that's called There's No Good Card for This. Um, it is well illustrated. It's super interactive and digestible um, with kind of like a, a cheeky sort of tone to it. It's a great read. Um, Dr. Alan Wolfelt, anything he does out of the Center of Law for Loss in um, Denver. He has some great things on companioning the bereaved, but also on workplace settings. Um, in my own journey, I love um, Lament for a Son by Nicholas Walters Staff. Yep. Um, there's also uh, Gregory Boyd wrote a book called A Grief Observed, maybe. Is that the C.S. Lewis one? Uh, it's a C.S. Lewis title, yeah. Yes, it's not a grief observed then. It's a grief something, but look it up with Gregory Boyd. I read it um, annually. The book that you were referencing, I also really enjoy The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Klerk. Um, and he is an excellent practitioner. That book is specifically about trauma and helping people recover. Mm -hmm. um, but I was mentioning to you at break, it is the most underlined book um, that mm. I've read in the last five years. And it is both anecdotal and uh, deeply scientific, by no means an easy read, but a worthwhile one. You know, I'm thinking, you know, along with videotaping and all the rest of that stuff, I'm thinking to myself, uh, we need to have you uh, come to my classes at IUPUI. And one of the things that uh, I do is I invite folks in, outside guests, mm. Uh, to speak to issues of communication, HB has been on, in our um, in our program there at IUPUI. What interests me in this connection, because I'm teaching a course called Reading, Writing, and Inquiry, would be your story-based connections and your writing ability then to say to students, "Look, these are th the realities of life, and these are things you're going to be engaging." And here's just one more avenue, another person uh, that doesn't look like Mark, you know, that uh, is going to be able to speak to issues. You know, your voice, your platform, I just see this thing as exploding because there's such a need for this in our culture. Well, thank you. I appreciate that encouragement and affirmation. And um, truly, I, for a long time, harbored a desire to be a university professor. That is not the, the path that I've gone on. So that, that touches on um, some aspirational aspects that okay. I had. 
Well, let me know when you want to get into a PhD program. <laughs> I, did, I, I teach actually, in one. Well, I actually um, applied to doctoral programs and got accepted to some. There was a um, period of time where I thought I was going to be a business professor. Okay. But that was actually um, right around that time when I was pregnant with Moses and got the news of his condition. And I, I wasn't quite sure if doctoral yeah. work was where I was going to go. Right. but. Um, we realized that being close to Riley and close to family um, had a different level uh, of importance. That's a big so deal right is, there. It is a road not traveled. Mm -hmm. but. but keep it in the back of your mind because I do want to talk to you about that. We'll talk about that after the show. But anyway, uh, we've got about five minutes left. Um, I want you to just tell people in, say, two minutes mm -hmm. that something that you want to leave them with that you don't want them to forget, you know, uh, the the – kind of covering for everything maybe that you've said or maybe something you haven't said, you take it away. Two minutes. The power of your empathy matters. Actually, when people are going through something hard, they feel, um, they feel alone. There's so much that they don't even... I found I didn't even know myself in the midst of that. I didn't know what I wanted. I felt like I was exhausted all the time. I felt like I was failing and so much less. I was less of the student I wanted to be. I was less of the mom. I was less of the sister. Like I was so depleted in everything. And that's a really vulnerable place to be at, especially when you just, you have to keep the wheel spinning. You have to keep parenting. You have to keep showing up to work. All of that, what that means is if you are a person who can speak into or have meaningful gestures into that place for someone, it's so impactful. Um, and really, like, your kindness is your credentialing. There, there are better and worse mm -hmm. ways to do it. Um, we teach on that. There's an equipping to it. But if you're wondering, like, hey, should I say something? Or maybe I don't, like, say something. Write that card. Um, think about what you're, you're good at. You know, not everybody is great at bringing meals. That's not the way they express care. But, what, like, what can you do? Do you mow lawns? Can you give a gift certificate? Can you... Um, you know, take somebody's kids for the afternoon. Can you pick up some of their slack at work? Can you take them out to lunch? Like, people need such a multiplicity of touch points that the worst thing that you can do is to not say anything mm. or to pretend that nothing is going on. And actually, like, whether it's in a friendship or in an organization, like, what that care does is it actually, like, people don't forget that. They will speak about you, they will recommend mm. you, they will you will deepen in your relationships, even mm. if you're looking at it from the strictly economic view, like it's impactful and yeah. it matters. So I would encourage people, um, for whoever you might be thinking of right now, and say like you missed it. Say like you missed it early on. You go, Oh man, like that happened a year ago and I didn't like I failed in this and oh I'm listening to this and it makes me feel icky. People in their cycles of grief, they need support. Like, it's not something that's done in six months. It's not something that's done in a year. And it's never too late to step in mm. and be a person like, it always means something to me. Whenever someone says, I was with a business associate yesterday, and he said, you know what, this time of year, I just always think of you and Mercy, my wife mm. and I do. And even eight years later, like, it means something to me. So it's never too late, even if you feel like you missed the moment for an initial empathetic gesture, go do it. Yeah. Feel empowered. Uh, well, I don't know about anybody else been listening to this or watching us on Facebook Live, but this has been just such an invigorating time here today with, with uh, Liza. We're really grateful for the time that you've mm -hmm. spent with us, and thank you so much for uh, your energy. It's obvious that uh, what God has gifted you to do and given you opportunity to do will be profitable and successful for so many people into the future. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for the good work can you I, do. Can I throw out one thing? Please check out our Handle with Care, Empathy at Work um, podcast. There are more resources there as well. So. Many, many good things at your website also. Re, uh, remind people of the website. Spell your name one more time. Yes, lieselmertes.com, L-I-E-S-E-L-M-E-R-T-E-S.com. -E 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 Very good. You've been listening to Warp and Woof Radio, radionext.tv at the Cool Groove site. We come to you every Wednesday, though next Wednesday we're going to be taking a break over Memorial Day week. Thank you ever so much for joining us for these three and a half plus years that we've been doing this. For all of the guests, I speak for all of them and say thank you again for joining us today uh, for the opportunity to share the good work that you're doing around Indianapolis. We're grateful. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank HB, you thank you again for your good work behind the scenes, brother, and uh, for Josh, who's going to take care of all the tech stuff, for Polly, who put us in connection here uh, with our guests today. We're always grateful for all the good folks that are doing this. If you have any connections with folks in and around Indy, Christians who are doing good, do not uh, fail to reach out to me. Uh, shoot me in a uh, Facebook message or even uh, contact me via uh, email at echel, that's E-C-K-E-L, 1957 at gmail be happy to get right back to you and uh, talk about some of the folks that we need to have on the show we're grateful for your presence today thanks ever so much and we'll see you in two weeks